we have come around the bend of Arabia, and this, of, uh, this body of water, of course, is an arm of the great Indian Ocean. And now that most of you have crossed the Indian Ocean, we're, we're suddenly getting a, a little crowded by land. Now, we're out in the middle of the Red Sea, and you don't see the land, but it's really coming, becoming more and more constricted. We are not near the land in our cruising because this sea has very shallow um, bordering continental shelf and then a very deep center. And it, 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 uh, it's unusual because it's almost like a big uh, sausage, this uh, body of water. Now, we've come around from the Persian Gulf all the way around uh, Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea, into the Gulf of Aden. And now we've passed in the morning this great strait of uh, Ben Al-Mandeb, and then we are up, uh, in the middle of this long body of water coming up toward the Suez. Of course, these waters make uh, the, the great Saudi Arabian, Arabian Peninsula almost a, a, uh, an island, except for, of course, it's connected to Asia Minor and Africa here by the, the brief piece of land that is the connection where we will pass in the Suez Canal. Now, the, this uh, sea is bounded by mountains on both sides, and we'll get a look at it as we go to Aqaba in particular, because the, the hills get very dramatic and very sharp there. Uh, there are similar mountains all the way down the coast of Saudi Arabia and on the Egyptian down to the Sudanese and Eritrean side. And this is a result of the geology that formed this particular sea. Now, here's a little clearer view of it, that it has a very deep center. Uh, and a lot of these, sh you see the shoals on the, particularly the southern end, uh, about 25% of the Red Sea is less than 50 meters deep. And so there are these great shelves and lagoons and a lot of coral. And then in the center, it goes down to over 8,000 feet deep. That's almost 3,000 meters. And so it has a very dramatic drop off in the center. And then it has volcanic islands in the, in the center, one of which erupted in 1997 down near the southern end of it. Of course, we go a full, it's almost 1,400 miles, that's about 2,200 kilometers, the full length of it. So when, when, you, uh, when you come onto the sea, it actually is a, a much larger, or rather a longer stretch than you imagine. That's why traditionally it would take, uh, in a sailing vessel, it would take uh, weeks to get along it because of the very um, variable winds as you pass from the north to the south or up. Of course, we are steaming along at our speed and on a schedule. This sea was formed by the motion of the continents, and we are at one of the great ridges of division between the continents. Uh, this is also part of the great uh, rift valley that is, uh, continues up on the east coast of Africa through the central valleys. And then uh, the, the, the Red Sea was originally all land, and the continents are actually separating here. Now, this is... Uh, a view of what the Earth used to be. You're familiar with plate tectonics and the motion of the cr Earth's crust and the different continents coming and going. This is very early back when, uh, over 500 million years ago, when they were not even identifiable as we know them. Later, there was a great Pangaea uh, continent where they were all together, and then they've been separating ever since. So you can now uh, identify some of the different continents, Africa, South America, India, of course, came up and joined up with the Eurasian continent. Antarctica and Australia took their own way. And then about 200 million years ago, in the Triassic period, we had the Red Sea was actually part of the Tethys Sea, or what is now the Indian Ocean. And it was open, and then it has closed up again at one point when the, in the last ice age, when the sea levels were lower, the Red Sea was actually a dry uh, depression, sort of like the Dead Sea is today. And then at a certain point, it, the seas rose and it poured in at that state, strait in the south of the Red Sea and filled up the ocean as it is today. Uh, and just today, though, the continents are still moving. If you stand out on deck, uh, long enough, you'll see the separation of them. Uh, it's almost a centimeter a century. So when you come back in another hundred million years, the Red Sea is predicted to open up and be a bigger and broader and uh, maybe even a happier ocean. But right now, uh, it is uh, in these plates that are separating, and 
it is surrounded, as I said, by fairly steep uh, cliffs, which define it as a uh, uh, almost a large ocean strait. Now, eventually, the Suez Canal will actually open up, and the Mediterranean and the Red Sea will also be one again, as they were in very ancient times. But this whole area is defined climatically, especially by the Great Sahara Desert. The prevailing winds are west and northwest. And what this does is blow great sandstorms all across this area. Now, the ancient Egyptians called this area the Dashret, which means the Red Land. And then this was the Sea of the Red Land. And then there have been other reasons why it ended up with the name Red Sea. The a certain time of year, there's a plankton bloom that makes it red. But in ancient history, the, the directions had colors attached to them. So red was south, white was west, black was north, as in the Black Sea, and then yellow was the east. And so some ancient texts refer to the Southern Ocean as the Red Sea. But in, in Egyptian, or rather in Greek, it became the Erythea Thas, uh, Thalassa, which means the Red Sea. In Latin, it became the Mare uh, Rubrum, and then in Arabic, it's Al-Bahar Al-Amer. These all refer to the redness of, the, of this sea, which is sometimes a sheen of dust will co uh, cover the sea and give it a kind of a tawny color. But uh, as you look out today, you'll see it looks like most other blue waters because of the depths and the reflection of the sky. Now, seasonally, the monsoons don't really come into this area. This is a dry and a almost a waterless area. There are no rivers that run into the Red Sea, making it uh, subject to the least amount of fresh water of any sea in the world. It has a very high evaporation rate and a, and a higher salinity than any other sea. And some of the sea life has adapted to that. But you can see in this illustration of how the winds point and the volume of them, there is a conflicting wind during the northeast monsoon reflected off the mountains of Africa but primarily from the Mediterranean and northern Egypt, there is a wind from the west-northwest that comes down the Red Sea. And uh, we are um, uh, 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 in a mixed season now. It's not so windy right now, but in, this, in the summer monsoon, uh, there's still, as you see, a northern wind in the northern Red Sea, but uh, there's a great sweep of wind going off to uh, India that of course, gives tremendous rainfall over there, but this area stays very, very dry. There's uh, only half uh, uh, an inch of rain a year in the Red Sea area, and that's only uh, an evaporant that gets caught up in some of the sandstorms and then drops back down. But this means it is dry as dry can be. In very old times, prior to maybe even any human habitation around here, it was much more lush. There were the remnants of forests, and you may have read that the, the entire Sahara has been growing over the thousands of years uh, in, because of somewhat perhaps the deforestation by humans. There used to be more cities and towns along the Red Sea 3,000 years ago than there are today, even with the great population that is concentrated, especially in Egypt. Well, what this does is uh, you know, it creates a sort of a myth of the great division of the sea. Uh, now I'm showing a picture here, one of uh, many of when the book of Exodus when Moses took the uh, Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. And this is a, 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 a historic fact that has become grander with the telling to the point where it's now illustrated like this or in great movies with Charleston Heston and it's suddenly a crossing of a sea that is incredibly deep and of course they, they flee and then the Pharaoh's army comes and is washed and drowned in the sea. Well, it, uh, some historians have been trying to find any evidence that this actually happened. And then there's thought that it was probably not out in the middle of this uh, long and very deep sea, but up on the Suez side where there are a series of lakes, especially one lake called uh, Timsa that is right near the Great Bitter Lake. And when the wind is very strong and the tide is receding, the, uh, the shore will be exposed, or the ground of the sea will be exposed, and you can actually walk out into that water, and then if the wind diminishes, the tide comes back in, uh, the water is back. And that may have been where the Israelites first crossed, and then, of course, with telling it, the sea got bigger. Uh, I was reading one, uh, let's say, a literalist uh, account that it's actually near Aqaba, where the crossing was, 
and one group says they have seen evidence of um, chariots and horses and things that are buried in the sea bottom, and that is evidence that uh, the crossing was by Aqaba. But that is, by most historians, considered too far away from where the Israelites probably left Egypt, which would be near Suez or where the Suez Canal is today. Well, nonetheless, uh, uh, the, the legend goes on, and when the, uh, the, the, the height of the Egyptian era, they had navigation down the Red Sea to the land of Punt, it was called, where they would pick up cinnamon and timber and spices, and this was probably the coast of Somalia. Later, navigation continued down. The Greeks came down. Uh, Alexander sent an expedition, which then came to the result of this um, illustration, later illustration, of, of a book that was written called the Erythenium Paraplus, which meant the Red Sea uh, directions to establish a trade route down through this part of uh, the Middle East and then all the way to India. And I showed this illustration before that uh, there were many trading po points along the Red Sea that are now gone. Uh, there is, of course, still some inhabitation, but uh, this was a lusher and more active area a thousand, two thousand years ago than it is today. It's been getting drier and, of course, the civilization has shifted considerably. Uh, but many people have come and gone through the sea on their way to the farther east. Uh, even the Portuguese came and tried to uh, conquer Aden. They were repulsed, so they did not control the Red Sea at that time during the uh, 1500s. Now here's one of the abandoned towns along the Red Sea. This is on the Sudanese side near Port uh, Sudan where it had been a major trading post uh, about a thousand years ago and now it is in ruin. Uh, it, but nearby, you can see in the illustration, that's one of the great oil terminals that are being built by the Chinese. So even if uh, one era comes and goes, there's always something else that follows. Now here's an old illustration I showed also before of the Arabic view of the world which has the Saudi Arabian Peninsula right in the center. This is the Red Sea, however inaccurate, and the River Nile is in red. A later illustration with North Up, though, shows again the Arabian Peninsula in the center of the world, and then Africa stretching uh, almost uh, larger, looming larger than Euro Europe or Asia in this particular illustration. And then a, uh, a more modern view of it, this is a Saudi Arabian map that describes the Red Sea here and the ocean and what they will call the Arabian Gulf. And so Arabia in general is surrounded by sea, but of course it's a great sea of sand in the center, the great empty quarter is right here. And there is not much population along this whole Arabian coast until you get down to Yemen, and then of course we were in Oman over here. Uh, most of the population is in the north and away from this area just because of the aridity of it and the distance from where commerce and other activities go on. Now we've already sailed along the coast of Oman, Yemen, this is the Gulf of Aden. This is an island called Socatra, which is a part of Somalia, and Somalia is down here. This is the Great Horn of Africa. Uh, we sail through the night and past uh, this area and into the Red Sea is here. Here's an old German map of the area, and we pass through that strait. Now this area is, again, very dry and rough. It has one unusual tree, though, that grows in an area that otherwise hardly anything else grows, called the dragon tree. Some of you may have seen this because they also exist in the Canary Islands. And this was considered a, a very magical tree in ancient times because the sap of it is red, and it was, was used for uh, medicinal purposes. It's sort of an astringent and antibiotic quality to it. But this is a kind of a curious tree, a desert blooming tree that uh, is unique to this area, and also the Canary Islands, curiously, but I don't, I've never seen it anywhere else. Now we are passing along already past the Bab al-Mandab, and we are already up into the main broad area of the central Red Sea. You can see it's surrounded with a few different countries, Yemen, Eritrea, which broke off from Ethiopia, uh, and Djibouti, which is its own small country, Somalia is down here. Now this is pretty wild territory all through here and most sailing instructions say stay far from the coasts and keep going. And we of course have uh, 
people watching out for us and our, our ship is uh, the, the safest place to be in this troubled area. But I'll show you a little closer view of this Bab al-Mandab, which in Arabic means the Strait of Tears. This area has very strong currents right through that strait, uh, even though there's not very large tides, um, less than a meter at, at, at the strongest of tides in the whole Red Sea. But they'll pour through this strait and uh, there are a lot of rocks and islands right there that are very dangerous if you uh, get caught on them, and many ancient vessels were shipwrecked right there. Uh, there's also this m island, which is an active volcano. It, it erupted in 1997. Um, but if you look at the sat view, there are a couple of islands, a bunch of little rocks, and so we had to pass right around and get through there. This passage from Saudi Arabia over to uh, what is actually Eritrea at that point, is only 29 kilometers. And uh, this is the, the point where the uh, Bin Laden Construction Company, the largest in Arabia, uh, proposed to build one of the world's largest bridges and a whole series of highways to connect Africa to the Arabian Peninsula uh, and then have highways all the way up to the Emirates and other parts of Saudi Arabia. Uh, it has been debated in this area for a while, but it has not been uh, decided to build it because as soon as you have a bridge and a major highway system, then the, the problem is, is they would probably have so many refugees coming from Africa to live in Arabia that then they would not be able to stop that traffic. Now, of course, there's no bridge and no traffic other than some smaller vessels that cross there. Most recently, there was a um, Yemeni Navy trying to stop the smuggling of arms uh, from Africa to some of the rebels uh, who are fighting right now today in uh, parts of Yemen. Here's a navigation map that shows you some of the straits and the markings and some of the hazards. We, our ship came around the Baba Mandeb and then we went to the uh, east side of this um, Zayar Island and then up through the larger opening of uh, broader waters of the Red Sea. By the way, I did bring my own nautical charts here. If anybody's interested to examine the Red Sea chart and the Suez Canal chart, you can come up and we'll look at that later. But here's a little more view of some of the hazards of the Red Sea. There are all of these flats. Uh, they're called shakur in Arabic, these um, coral or else sand flats that are very shallow all through these areas. With all, These are coral reefs, so there's a very extensive coral all through this area, and now the courses are, are buoyed and marked, and this is a traffic separation uh, marker so that we've seen some of the big ships coming through here. It's all very regulated now so that there, uh, there are no collisions and, and, no, and nobody gets caught on the rocks like they used to before it was well marked. Here is the Saudi side, and here's the Egyptian side, and you can see that there's archipelagos of islands, coral, uh, and uh, uh, very shallow water all through this region. Now as we come up to the northern end of the sea, we pass a few reefs and what are called the Brothers, which are reefs with lighthouses on them. And then we come to the Great Sinai Peninsula, which is this great triangle that has the Gulf of Aqaba and then the Gulf of Suez here. And of course we are on our way to Aqaba up at the top of the bay there. Now this is a sort of a dramatic piece of land and sea because you have this, uh, what is now a very sh a shallow sea nearby and then you have the great rise of the mountains right in Mount Sinai and St. Catherine's Monastery. So you get this great overlook into the desert and across the sea here. Uh, but for, for navigation you have to be quite uh, skillful in the old days to get through and make your way around some of these areas. It is today very, uh, very well marked, of course. Here is one of the lighthouses on the Brother Island, so that all the shipping that now comes through this area is carefully directed and safely on their way. Now as we come up, we reach the Great Suez Canal. Now this is a engineering triumph of the 19th century, opened in 1869 designed by the great uh, French engineer Lefert, who later went on to try to build the Panama Canal. Uh, but this became a world-changing canal that made the route to Asia so much uh, more convenient and, of course, was the uh, access for the great British Empire for, for so many 
uh, decades. But there, were, there, were, there was an earlier canal that um, left from just south of here, the Suez, back in the 6th century BC. Darius, the great emperor of Persia, came to conquer Egypt, and they dug a canal from Cairo across to the Gulf of Suez. And this was the first time that navigation connected the Red Sea to the Great River and then out into the Mediterranean. Uh, that canal has subsequently silted up and is now covered over and there's very little evidence of it. Uh, but this Great Suez Canal was built to be a major shipping channel for ocean-going vessels to come right through. And here's one of the illustrations as it comes from the, from the Mediterranean down through the lagoon after Port Said and then down to the Bitter Lake and then out into the Gulf of Suez. Now this was originally a fairly small construction for smaller vessels and as you see there were sort of sailing barges that uh, used it originally. There was a lot of offloading and reloading because it wasn't big enough for the largest of the vessels at the time. Uh, later it was widened. Here's a photo of when it was somewhat smaller but it was continually worked on and widened and even now it, it continues to be dredged and widened because the ships keep getting bigger. Uh, here is a illustration about 1905 of one of the steamers coming through. Now the winds are very um, di uh, variable around here um, sometimes so that a sail vessel is often at a disadvantage in a canal and uh, in the Suez Canal and in the Panama Canal in their, when they were opened most of the sail, large sail vessels would be towed through until they of course became steamers. And so today uh, you can see this is sort of a giant ditch that runs through the desert and then it has a very broad and uh, uh, spacious navigation through parts of it and it is by international treaty open to all nations including warships at all times. So by international agreement this is one of the key straits of the world. Others being in other nations that are similarly open. For instance the Strait of Malacca or Sunda or other areas of the world where shipping has a right to pass. Now here's an illustration before the canal of the great Gulf of Suez. It's very shallow and there are a lot of um, reefs and also there have been a lot of wrecks in that area because uh, at nighttime people didn't know where they were going. Now again it is channelized and also has a separation schemes and a lot of uh, markers so that it's very clear how to go there and we will be passing through uh, through the whole day into the canal and then in the center of uh, the passage there is what the there are two lakes called the Great and the Lesser Bitter Lake and these are called bitter because they're very saline they're very salty there's um, again no fresh water comes in the, um, the the main body of the Red Sea is refreshed by some tide that comes from the Indian Ocean so that it uh, is not quite as salty as otherwise it would be like this very uh, salty lake like the Dead Sea and uh, there's almost no life in this lake but nowadays there's a lot of uh, shipping. Now, during the history of the Suez Canal it's, uh, it's been a bit I say kicked around in the sand uh, when 1956 when Nasser nationalized it uh, British and French troops came to hold it and then they were um, not supported by the US and the Soviet Union at the time and has now remained in Egyptian hands uh, but uh, then uh, during the Six Day War uh, the Israelis came and took the Suez Canal and then it was closed f from 1965 to 1974 and some ships were actually stranded in the Bitter Lake and they were uh, skeletons crude but there was a society to this day of the great the navy of the great bitter lake that was bottled up until the canal was opened up again so the security of this canal is very critical when there was a war and it was closed that led many of the shipping companies to say well we are going to go around cape hope rather than risk any of our shipping through this uh, canal which uh, could have problems um, you can imagine though in our current political situation were it under British or French authority it would be a target now that it's under Egyptian authority uh, it is fairly peaceful and safe and there's no political problem with the Suez Canal and it's somewhat analogous to the Panama Canal were that under American authority it would have to have far more security than it has to have under Panamanian control 
but that's the political background of the Suez Canal. Now, as we pass through it, it will be a long day of looking at the sand. Actually, the most interesting part of it is looking at all of the ships close up. Uh, but last time I came through, there was one of these sandstorms that blew the, sh the ship so hard. It was blowing about 50 knots, and the, the ship was blown aground onto the banks of the canal. And because it's all sand, the ship just sort of nestled in the sand. And then when the wind relented, uh, it pulled off, and there was no damage to the ship. But there's quite a bit of traffic. A lot of waiting goes on to get through, depending on the season and the amount of, of traffic. There have also been some bad accidents uh, in, the, in the canal and in the surrounding areas. Here's a, a Korean ship that caught fire. That was not a terrorist attack. It was a ship fire, engine fire, that burnt this uh, vessel up. Uh, but there is considerable watch so that ships like ours are not in harmed on our passage either through the canal or especially down to the Red Sea and out to the Indian Ocean. So you saw some of these frigates uh, accompanying us the, the other day in the Indian Ocean. As we come to the Suez Canal, we're under Egyptian watch. But in other places, there's been more trouble. This was the bombing of the USS Cole uh, in, Aden, in Yemen in 2005. So the danger is there with uh, ship attacks and that's why we keep our guard up, especially in the r wilder coast outside of the Red Sea. Uh, there have been no pirate attacks within the Red Sea itself that I've heard of, though that's not part of Somalia and the wilder coast around the Horn of Africa. But the sea itself is fairly placid. Uh, you might know we have a bit of wind chop now, but there's very little of that oceanic swell that you'll get in the broader ocean. So it, it'll feel more like a lake here, and you'll, you know, you're, we're feeling a little bit of it on the, the ship today because we are going against the wind and we are slapping a bow wave. But often it is very placid like this, and the, the sea is also very shallow so that you can go swimming and walk out onto uh, broad flats. It doesn't drop off very quickly, except, except in a few places, particularly right where we're going in Sharm al-Sheikh. That, that happens to be off the reef. It goes very deep right there in a reflection of the mountains that are uh, rising on the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, here is one of the phenomena I mentioned. This, these sandstorms blow off of the Sahara, and they drop a great um, annual load of sand and minerals into the water. And this then creates an annual um, plankton uh, bloom in the Red Sea. And this may be also where it got its name. There is a kind of plankton that's called Trichodesimium erytheum, which blooms so red that it looks like the water is uh, uh, some sort of a cocktail they'd serve at the bar. And then this is the basis for a lot of the rich marine life of the Red Sea, because there's a whole food chain that lives off of these plankton blooms and the, the mineral content of the water. Many species are unique to the Red Sea. Uh, some 10% of the, of the thousands of kinds of fish and uh, various levels of um, life are unique to the Red Sea because of its high salinity and also its uh, relatively hot water. It's three to five degrees warmer than any other sea around it. This is the most northern tropical sea in the world, and, uh, but it also has more rich plankton and f fish life than most tropical seas, which are generally mineral poor. And this is because of the, the winds of the Sahara refresh the sea with plenty of uh, minerals all the time. Now here is a curious eel that lives in the shallows of the Red Sea. And again, it's a unique eel that bores down and comes up to feed and then will go back into the water. And it's an example of some of the curious uh, marine life in the area. And in ancient times when um, the first travelers were here, they were not exactly um, uh, interested in the minutia of marine biology. In fact, they were often terrified by sea monsters and uh, th things like this if they were in the water. And so it may have led to this illustration from, uh, a later illustration from Dante's Inferno. And you can see the sea snakes uh, terrifying those who are being uh, on their way to hell or wherever they're going. And uh, I'll read the uh, the inscription there from the Inferno Canto 24. Amid this dread exuberance of woe ran naked spirits winged with horrid fear. 
nor hope had they of crevice where to hide or heliotrope to charm them out of view. So the view of the ocean and the wilds of the sea often was quite fantastic in medieval times, thinking that creatures like this uh, lived in the oceans and uh, were the, ha the, the, the hazard for navigation and uh, any visitors to the ocean. Nowadays, of course, we have creatures like this in the Red Sea that are far more, you know, let's say, pleasant to uh, see, and the Red Sea has become a major tourist destination. Uh, it is so close to Europe and other population centers, and it is also so nice and warm in the winter that now thousands of people come every day to all of the resorts that are built on the north end of the Red Sea. There's very little, on the, of course, on the Saudi side or in the southern part uh, just because of the political or infrastructure problems of those areas. But uh, diving in this area is one of the great sports and destination for scuba divers and snorkelers and vacationers from all around the world, because the water is so clear you can see a lot more than you can see perhaps in any other part of the world. There's such an abundance of marine life matched with the clarity of the water. It means you see turtles and dolphins, and I'll just show you uh, some of the, uh, the, the wildlife of this, this great sea. Uh, there are some 40 kinds of sharks and larger um, marine mammals, dolphins, but they, again, they are mostly in the shallows. The very middle of it in the deep sea is usually empty. I've never read or seen any whales in this sea. I don't think they come through the straits. Uh, even if they did, they might uh, be happy to be here. But it may be just be too warm. Most migration of whales is uh, very sensitive to the temperature, and the Red Sea is sort of a warm bath all the time. So there, there are some indigenous sharks that don't go out into the Indian Ocean because they are more suited or de developed just in the Red Sea. Uh, here's a kind of a wrasse, a large, almost like a gigantic grouper. These grow to be tremendous size, maybe uh, up to two meters long. And then uh, here's an illustration of where the dive sites are. Now, I myself, I'm going to go diving uh, when we get to Charm to see if, uh, see if the fish are still friendly out there. Uh, but this has become a pretty big industry with people coming to the Red Sea just for the diving. And uh, there's an area um, in the Gulf of Aqaba where there is a ledge and a giant uh, opening in the sea, and that's the famous blue hole where you can dive down and there's a whole deep shelf and arches and a lot of uh, marine life. It's unfortunately uh, been the cause of many uh, diving accidents, and so it's uh, referred to as the Diver's Cemetery because some 40 people have died in that blue hole because they get disoriented by the light and the ledges, and they go far deeper than they should, and they get uh, narcosis. And uh, just this year, two divers have died there. Now, I promise not to go there myself, but uh, I've, uh, I'll show it to you. Uh, just don't, don't hold your breath. But the, the, the sea is uh, full of bright fish, these little goldfish. They, they, there's some indigenous ones just to the Red Sea. Uh, they're, they're called the uh, Anthea fish. And uh, there's some spotted rays uh, that skim along. Uh, but the Red Sea is most famous for its great coral. Because there is so little uh, swell and there are relatively few storms that will churn up the sea, the coral grows larger and more various than most other seas, especially the soft coral. You see here, this is not a hard coral. This is sort of waves in the, in the sea. It opens up and, you know, but, but coral has a very uh, unique um, symbiosis. It has an algae in it that then provides photosynthesis that then f feeds the coral. And without that uh, symbiosis, there would be no coral. And uh, recently they found that uh, there's a kind of an al algae that grows in the coral of the Red Sea that is uh, heat resistant, such that this kind of coral in other seas uh, would not survive. And so they've been, they've been trying to, uh, some of the marine biologists have been trying to transplant the algae from Red Sea coral to corals in other parts of the oceans that are warming, hoping that when global warming heats up the seas, this strain from the Red Sea will help other coral systems in the world survive. But it's quite a sight. Uh, uh, these things grow to be 
five, six, ten feet tall, so that for divers it's probably the, the greatest uh, view of soft coral in the world. And up close it has uh, you know, these filigree fans that will come out in the day and take the plankton and then uh, recede at night. And then they also have uh, what they call a coral bloom, which is a lunar-based uh, spawning, so that the coral will all spawn on a full moon in the, uh, at, at, at different times of the year, depending on the species. But then they will will cast off their eggs, and that'll create a feeding frenzy among all the fish. And so this is one of the great uh, remarkable things about the ocean, this life that goes on. Uh, when you're on a ship, you don't really notice it, and uh, we're, we're just sort of seeing a great blue desert out there, but just below us is all of this life. So if you do go diving, uh, it's uh, fairly safe because of the lack of currents and lack of storms, but there are some hazards. This is the lionfish, which is a spiny, curious-looking uh, fish, but if you touch it, you'll get a very bad sting. It uh, keeps it uh, safe from the many uh, larger predators. Now, this, this fish, though, has begun to travel and move into northern waters. I believe it's now through the Mediterranean. I know it's in the North Atlantic, so this kind of a tropical fish is beginning to move with the warmer water into areas where it was unseen before. But here are just a few of the other creatures that we will not see from uh, above water, nor will we see it on the menu. Here's a sailfish tang, and this is a kind of a, a bullheaded fish, the butterfly fish, and then there are these little sand darters, they're called that'll live and only pop out to feed and hide the rest of the time. Again, many of these are, are unique to the Red Sea because of its unusual conditions. And then there's a whole variety of coral. I showed you some of the soft coral. This is a kind of a fan coral or a, or a shelf coral. Uh, and there's great sheets of this that stretch out. So um, you don't really need to go scuba diving to see a lot of this because the sea has these large shelves. If you just go snorkeling, you'll see plenty. And here's a, a living coral that is a, sort of looks like a big pillow, but of course it, um, some of them are anemic, uh, like anemones, so they'll sting you if you get close. And here is uh, the real red star in the real red sea. Here's a kind of a speckled crab. Um, some of these are quite unusual. Here's a, a Halloween hermit crab. So it seems to be red is the favorite color, but there are some um, contrasts. Here is a Chilodon sea slug, also not on the menu on the ship. Um, but I'll just show you a few more of the lovely creatures that we will be sailing over. I'm just getting you ready for lunch. <laughs> well, but the largest of the creatures in the sea uh, is the great whale shark. And uh, th this is a, not a true shark. It is a, um, it's, uh, I'm not sure, it's not a true whale. Uh, but it's a plankton feeder, and it grows to 60-some feet long, or 20 meters. And uh, it will come up into particularly the northern Red Sea during the plankton blooms to feed. Uh, and it's completely gentle. You may have seen one or two in an aquarium. Uh, I, can't I can't believe they catch them and get them into an aquarium, but I believe there's one living in the aquarium in Dubai. Uh, but if you are a diver, you have to be careful not to look like plankton, otherwise you might become like Jonah. And that, I think that's Jonah there swimming along. But, uh, but they have, as you see, they have no teeth and they're not really a shark. They're not a carnivore at all. Uh, and then there are some other monsters of the deep, which are the many, many shipwrecks that are all along the Red Sea area. Uh, because of all the, the reefs and the uncharted waters in olden times, uh, many a vessel went aground, especially when the canal opened and suddenly there were steamers coming from Europe. And uh, before there were enough buoys and lighthouses, uh, they would often run aground and then they would be stuck. And so this has become a, also a, a site and a goal of many a diver. Uh, here is a, an old British steamer that ran aground in 1870, uh, and it was one of the first ships that came through the 
canal and ran, or ran up on a reef. And the, the story is, is that uh, the, the passengers decided to wait for the tide and they decided that somebody would come pull them off and they, they, were, they did not get off the reef and the ship cracked and broke finally and many drowned. Um, here's another famous wreck, the uh, Threshgorn, which was a World War II supply vessel going to India and a German bomber caught it with a one bomb down the, the midships and the, the ship broke down and settled in fairly shallow water. It's only about uh, 20 meters deep, but its contents are all still there. It's full of bicycles and sewing machines and uh, munitions that are still there, un unfused though. And so this has become one of the great dive sites of the Red Sea. So this is where, again, the clarity of the water, the warmth, and the, let's say, the other charms of Egypt and Arabia bring many people to come here to, to dive and see this area. And so all along this whole northern stretch of the Red Sea, there's considerable development. Uh, some 90 major resorts have been built in the Sharm uh, al Sheikh area alone, and then we have Aqaba, you'll see it's quite well built up, Eliat uh, Israel, which is this uh, shore here. And this has led to, uh, of course, the unfortunate impacts of um, uh, sanitation, and uh, there's, an, uh, there's another particular problem in the area, which is, of course, the lack of uh, fresh water. So along the Red Sea on Egyptian and also on especially the Saudi side, there are a lot of desalination plants, and they will draw water out of the sea, desalinate it, but they will pull, put back into the sea a, a um, highly saline uh, effluent with uh, chemicals in it from the process, and then that is killing uh, the coral and having a, a continuing a deteriorating effect on the uh, marine life in the Red Sea. So the impact of humanity, of course, is uh, well known around the world, but in the last decade especially, there have been the construction of a lot of new resort areas. Here's a El Guana on the Egyptian side. And uh, there's whole areas that are built just for the Russian trade now. I, was, I came down here last year and, and there was a whole area that all the signs are in Russian and they were having a, a very good time there, I'd say. <clears throat> um, I also went down to a, uh, a port called um, Safaga to board a ship, and I came in in the middle of the night. 2 a.m. I was taken by the port agent uh, through all this traffic of the resort area and then down to a, a customs uh, clearance area for a, a dock that was the um, embarkation point for the pilgrims on the Hajj to go to Mecca. Now Mecca and Medina, they're on the Saudi side of the Red Sea. And this was during the Hajj and I came in to this hall. I thought at 2 a.m. it would be empty and there'd be some sleepy customs official who would stamp my passport, put me on the ship, send me away. Well, I walked into the hall and there had to be over a thousand people standing in line. Oh, I'm sorry, I should, not people, they were men. And they looked like they had walked across Africa to get the ferry to go to Mecca and I was led in by the port agent around to the office and then I was put at the front of the line and processed. And I had never seen so many angry people looking at me, other than yourselves now. Uh, and I had cut the line and I, I didn't know enough Arabic to say it's not my fault. But anyway, I got through. But that's the contrast in this area. You have a very conservative and traditional Islamic culture and a lot of people living in the distances who come down to the Red Sea coast and what do they see? Topless bathing Russians and uh, drinking and partying. And so there's a very big cultural conflict along the shores of the Red Sea. Uh, but the Egyptian government, of course, guarantees everybody's security as much as they can and have built more and more villas, hotels, provided the infrastructure and the support for a growing industry, which, of course, is the biggest industry in Egypt. And without it, the overpopulated uh, nation of Egypt would not have enough income to feed itself. Uh, and so you have attractions like uh, tall ships coming in for cruises on the local coast of uh, the Red Sea, and you have a lot of visitors having a very good time. And so this is, uh, you know, a whole new era of history for this part of the world and this ancient sea with, which has so much history. And they're still planning to build more and more developments all along the coast, uh, I mean, the coast is endless. There are endless uh, opportunities for development. And, and like Dubai, it seems to always have uh, uh, the sky is literally the limit. And so you'll see uh, when you're ashore, there's 
many offerings, and my advice is you should buy now before the price goes down yet again. <laughs> so this sea has a, it has a uh, truly a wildlife, both underwater and above water. And uh, with the last few scenes of it here, you can see that it, it truly is a Red Sea. And I wish all of you a wonderful time here as we pass on our way to that next sea, the Mediterranean. Thank you very much. My pleasure to say hello.